Okay, hey guys, welcome back to the channel. I hope you've been finding the other videos on biology, um, chemistry and psychology useful until now. And yeah, so today we'll talk about enzymes, which is the third chapter. And after that, we'll solve some questions. So the first thing you need to know about is what enzymes are. So in the previous chapter of biological molecules, we learned that some proteins are enzymes. So enzymes are protein molecules, which can act as a biological catalyst and since it is a catalyst, it will remain chemically unchanged at the end of the reaction. And how does it act as a catalyst is by reducing the activation energy required for a particular metabolic reaction. And they can be intracellular or extracellular. So intracellular means that they work and operate within cells. So for example, um, enzymes that work inside the mitochondria or DNA polymerase, which is works within the nucleus for DNA replication. Extracellular enzymes are those which are secreted out and are work outside of cells. So these are like digestive enzymes in the stomach, for example, or the fluid that is secreted in the intestines. So we need to talk about the structure as well. So they have they have proteins which have a specific tertiary structure and they're globular proteins. So the primary structure, which is a specific sequence of amino acids, this will determine the um, sequence which is present in the active site. And it's a globular protein. And it, so there's also folding in the secondary and tertiary structure because of hydrophilic and hydrophobic R groups. This gives enzymes um, a precise 3D shape. So all of these features give um, enzymes a specific 3D shape. And then in the 3D shape, there's an active site. And that active site helps to determine the specificity of the enzymes because it can only um, bind together with a specific substrate. So in this diagram over here, so it's from Save My Exam. So do check out their website. They have good notes on biology and good diagrams as well. So this um, diagram here shows energy and uh, rate of reaction. So you have substrate. So this is where you're starting and then this products. So this um, peak here, this is activation energy. So this is the amount of energy required for the reaction to occur. So this top one here is the one without catalyst. And this bottom one here is with the catalyst. So um, Biological catalysts or enzymes, they reduce the amount of activation energy required for the reaction to play, take place. And then over here, it's not drawn in this, but it's good to know that if you, if you do take chemistry as well, you know that from substrate to products, this will be delta H or energy yield. And just understand that the energy yield is independent of whether a catalyst is used. So with or whichever pathway it takes, the energy yield will always remain the same. So it has no effect. Okay. So we have already learned about the lock and key hypothesis, and this is one of the mode of actions of enzymes. So in the lock and key hypothesis, the enzyme is considered the lock and the substrate is considered the key. So enzymes have the active side of what we're talking about, and they can bind with substrates to form the enzyme substrate complex. So the active side over here, that's specific and complementary to the shape of the substrate. So upon collision, they both can bind together to form an enzyme substrate complex. This enzyme substrate complex is held together by temporary bonds between the substrate and R groups of the amino acids. And then the reaction will occur, the enzyme reaction will occur, which is converted into products. And before the products are released, the temporary bonds are broken. And there can be two types of reactions which um, enzymes can catalyze, which is anabolic and catabolic. So catabolic is breaking of complex molecules. So for example, breaking large food molecules into smaller ones and anabolic is building of a complex molecule from smaller things, for example, polynuclear, polynucleotides, um, acids, and stuff like that. So RNA, DNA synthesis. So this one we have not learned yet. So this induced hypothesis is almost the same as lock and key, but in this, the active side is not exactly complementary to the substrate. So upon binding or upon collision, the enzyme and substrate are held together and the enzymes active side will be changed somewhat. And then there's interactions between the substrate and the enzyme, which would cause this active, uh, active site to change and it will mold to form to the substrate's um, shape. So the, the active site will become complementary upon um, collision. So these interactions over here between substrate and enzyme cause the active site to change shape and become complementary. And the enzyme and substrate are held together by temporary bonds and the enzyme reaction occurs. So this, the second part is almost the same as the first one and then the temporary bonds are broken and products are released. So the most important thing you need to know is that
lactate star is not exactly complementary in this and it will change to become complementary. But in lock and key, the active star and the shape of the substrate are complementary and they're exactly um, complementary. They're, they can bind exactly. Okay. So what exactly do enzymes do? So we know that enzymes increase the rate of a chemical reaction. And we talked about how it reduces activation energy to increase the rate of the chemical reaction. So we have been talking about activation energy a lot. So activation energy is simply basically the amount of energy required for the reaction to take place. And so how do enzymes exactly reduce this activation energy? So firstly, the uh, shape of the substrate molecule will be slightly changed or distorted, which makes it easier to change the substrate into a product. So this is either by holding the substrate molecules in a way that the molecules can react more easily or they can influence the stability of the bond. So it, it's easier to break bonds and make the substrate more reactive for the uh, reaction to take place. So there's a bunch of factors which affect the rate of uh, enzyme catalyzed reaction. So one of them is enzyme concentration. So when enzyme concentration acts as a limiting reactant, you can increase the concentration of the enzymes. And as a, as a result, there's more active sites present uh, and thus more enzyme substrate complexes are formed. And Therefore, the initial rate of reaction is increased. So take note, it's only the initial rate can be compared. And as substrate concentration will decrease, so this, they're converted to products. Now the substrate concentration will start acting as a limiting reactant, but continued increase of the enzyme concentration will have no, no, further, uh, no further effect on the rate of reaction because at this point, the enzyme concentration is greater and there's more active sites present than substrates. So the substrate concentration acts as a limiting reactant. So the effect of substrate concentration on enzyme activity or enzyme catalyzed reaction is that firstly, they act as a limiting reactant. So if you increase it, there'll be um, an in increase in initial rate of reaction. This is because more molecules are present. So more enzyme substrate complexes are formed because more collisions can take place or successful collisions take place. So if you keep the enzyme concentration constant and increase substrate concentration, it will reach a maximum rate over here. So after this, the graph will level off. This is because this point itself is known as the Vmax. So we'll talk about this in enzyme affinities as well and KM in, in a few slides. So this is known as a maximum rate of working of enzyme. And at this point, the enzyme concentration will be the limiting reactant. So effect of temperature on enzyme activity. So you need to take note of the shape of this graph and I'll talk about this bell graph as well. So firstly, at low temperatures, we know that molecules will move slower. They have lower velocity, lesser kinetic energy, right? So there's lesser successful collision. So the number of ES complex formed will also be less. So the rate of reaction will be slow. But if you increase it, the molecules are moving faster. Collisions occur more. More enzyme substrate complex is formed. So the rate will increase. But if you continue increasing it, and you increase it further than this point known as the optimum temperature. So the optimum temperature is basically a point where the rate of reaction is maximum. So if you increase it further than that, the enzyme will become denatured. So what, we, what, what exactly happens with the enzyme is denatured is that the structure of the enzyme will vibrate so energetically that the bonds will break, which will cause the tertiary structure of the enzyme to be changed completely. So the active site itself is changed as well or altered. So if the active site is altered, the enzyme and substrate cannot bind. So the ES complex will not form anymore. So there's a decrease in the rate of reaction. And at this point, so over here, the decrease here is that enzymes are getting denatured and then once it becomes zero all the enzymes are completely denatured so you have to understand that this graph is is one-sided so there's a slow increase here and then a fast decrease here so unlike this ph graph which is the bell curve so whenever we change the ph from optimum ph so optimum ph over here is what we mean is that the ph which the rate of reaction is maximum so for example if you make it to acidic conditions for example it will Cause the hydrogen ions to interact with the R groups. So, which will affect ionization. So it affects ionic bonds, which is part of the tertiary structure. And then if the ionic bonds itself are disrupted, the 3D arrangement of the enzyme molecule is altered. The shape of the active site is changed. So similarly, the enzyme will become denatured and the enzyme substrate complex cannot form. So take note that any, any change itself from the optimum pH will cause enzymes to be denatured, not just in acidic conditions. So over here, if you make it more, Acidic, it will decrease, sorry. And then if you make it more basic, it also will decrease because the enzymes are getting denatured. So now we have learned something about 
inhibitors. So inhibitors can be competitive and non-competitive. So competitive inhibitors, they have a similar shape to enzymes substrate. So they compete with the substrate molecule to bind at the active site and to form the, so basically it prevents the substrate molecule from forming the sub, enzyme substrate complex. But if you increase the concentration of the substrate itself, there's increase in chance that the substrate will form the ES complex. So inhibition by the competitive inhibitor will be decreased or can be considered to be negated because more substrate molecules are present. So there's a higher chance that ES complex will form regardless of whether there's a small amount of inhibitor still present. So this is known as reversible inhibition because if you increase the substrate concentration, the um, effect of the inhibitor is reduced. So the next, uh, next part we need to know about is non-competitive inhibitors. So non-competitive inhibitors, they can bind to another part of the enzyme. This is known as the allosteric site. And these non-competitive inhibitors, they can disrupt the normal arrangement of hydrogen and hydrophobic interactions, which hold the um, enzyme in a 3D shape. So it disrupts the tertiary structure. So there's a distortion of bonds, and as a result, the enzyme will be denatured. And if the enzyme is denatured, the enzyme substrate complex cannot form. So the enzyme's function itself is blocked as long as the uh, non-competitive inhibitor is bonded to the enzyme. And this is this um, NCS function, or or how it inhibits the enzyme's function, is unaffected by um, increasing uh, enzyme's uh, substrate. If you increase it, it'll have no effect. So. The next thing we need to know about is enzyme affinities. So what we talked about is Vmax um, a few slides ago. So Vmax is where all enzyme molecules are saturated. And saturated basically means that they are all bound to substrate molecules. So you can read Vmax either through the curve, but it's an estimation. It's not exactly a very um, easy to get an accurate value. So you can plot this line weaver Berg plot. So in the line weaver Berg plot, you just let the y-axis be one over a and substrate concentration, oh, sorry, x-axis is one over substrate concentration, and it becomes a linear graph. And specifically, you need to know that the y-intercept is one over Vmax, and this x-intercept will be negative one over Km. And then whatever value you get at y or x, you can let it equal to that and then find, manipulate it to so that you can get the Km and Vmax value. So it's more, it's more accurate to find Vmax or Km, but you can still do it by the, uh, the curve. Okay, so Km is basically the substrate concentration where enzyme works at half Vmax. And Km is a measure of the enzyme's affinity for its substrate. So there's an inverse relationship between Km and affinity. So if there's high Km, it has low affinity, meaning more substrate concentration is required to reach the Vmax. And low Km means high affinity, which means less substrate concentration required to reach Vmax. So for example, enzymes which, are, which has a high Km, it works better when a large substrate concentration is present or more substrate concentration is present. But low Km, it works even better in low substrate concentration. So the last thing is immobilizing enzymes. So there's an advantage of why immobilization occurs or why we use immobilization. For example, this um, mi making milk without, without lactose because people have lactose intolerance. So first of all, there's no enzyme in the product, so they remain un uncontaminated. There's no need of filtration as well, so it's um, easier. And the immobilized enzyme, so they in elegant beads, right? So they can be reused again and again. You can just take the milk here and pour it again. And this is less costly, so you don't have to spend so much on enzymes over and over, because if you um, if you lose it, if you just pour, it, pour both of them in, in a solution together, you lose the enzyme at the end, right? So, there's also a greater tolerance of temperature and pH. This is because they are within these beads, right? So they, they are less affected or they're not directly affected by the temperature and pH change. So you could say that um, they could use high temperatures for faster rate as well. And so how do they make these and immobilize enzyme itself? So there's a mixture of sodium malignate and lactase. It's added to a beaker and the beaker contains calcium chloride. And this reaction itself, it produces alignate beads which contain the enzyme inside it. I'm not sure if they will ever ask you to ask never ask this question, but it might be required in paper three. So I've just included it here. Maybe you might want to just take a note. Maybe you could write it as a part of your procedure. There's a immobilization enzyme type of um, question. So let's just answer some questions and answer and get the answers to it. So I'll just pause it for like a second so you guys could read the question and try to answer this yourself. So which of these statements describe the action of an extracellular enzyme? 
So synthesis of a polynucleotide in the nucleus during DNA replication, digestion of macromolecules in the lumen but of the small intestine, synthesis of ATP molecules in the mitochondria. So I'll just pause it for a second so you could read it and try to answer it. Okay, so what we can tell from this is that option one and three is definitely wrong because this is within the mitochondria and this is the nucleus. So this, these both are intracellular enzymes. And if it's in the lumen of the small intestine, it means that the enzyme is being secreted. And what exactly is extracellular enzyme? So let's try to recall what extracellular enzyme is. It's an enzyme which is being secreted or works outside of cells. So the answer is only D, which is two. So this is the explanation. I'll just pause it for a second so you could read. So nucleus and mitochondria is inside the cell. So any enzyme that works there is intracellular. And we call the extracellular enzymes work outside the cell or secreted. So this next question, which statement about the effect of substrate concentration on the activity of an enzyme is correct? A, above a certain concentration of substrate, an enzyme reaches its Vmax, sorry, its maximum rate of reaction. At high concentration of competitive inhibitor, increasing the substrate concentration has no effect. At high substrate concentration, a non-competitive inhibitor is no longer is no longer affects the enzyme activity. The higher the concentration of substrate, the faster an enzyme, enzyme can catalyze the reaction. So let's pause it for a second and I'll let you try to answer this yourself. Okay, so so I, I would say that A is correct. So if you keep, so above a certain concentration of enzyme, so above a certain concentration of substrate and the enzyme concentration is kept constant and then you reach what's called Vmax, so maximum rate of reaction. So A is correct. So high, at high concentration of competitive inhibitor, increasing the substrate concentration has no effect. This is false because if you increase the substrate concentration, the inhibition by the competitive inhibitor decreases. And C is wrong as well because at high substrate concentration or non-competitive inhibitor has no longer affects the enzyme activity, which is wrong as well. Sorry. This is wrong as well because substrate concentration has no effect on NCI, which we discussed previously. So B and C is wrong. And why is D wrong? Because this D is saying that higher the concentration of substrate, the faster an enzyme can catalyze the reaction. So this increasing the substrate concentration has no effect on the enzyme directly. It affects the rate of the enzyme catalyzed reaction. So the, I would say D is wrong as well. So the answer should be A. So let's read this again. So you can get a better understanding. B is wrong. Competitive inhibition decreases with increase, increasing substrate concentration. This is because more substrate molecules, so increased chance of collision. C is wrong because NCI is not affected by substrate concentration at all. We discussed this. And the rate of the enzyme catalyzed reaction is increased as, as you increase the substrate concentration, but it does not exactly affect the enzyme itself. Okay, so this next question. So what features are correct of a competitive inhibitor of an enzyme catalyzed reaction? So we're talking about features of a competitive inhibitor. So binds to an active site, changes shape of enzyme, similar shape to substrate, rate of reaction affected by concentration of inhibitor. Okay, so I'll just pause it for a second and let you read this. Okay, let's continue. So competitive inhibitors, they do bind to the active site. This is correct. Change the shape of enzyme, no. Similar shape of substrate, yes. And rate of reaction is affected by concentration of inhibitor, yes, because if, if, you, if there's more um, competitive inhibitors present, there'll, there'll be more um, enzyme inhibitor complexes, so lesser, um, ES complexes can form itself. Okay, so what changes the shape of an enzyme? This would be non-competitive inhibitor because they um, alter the hydrophobic and um, interaction and hydrogen bonds. So this will change the tertiary structure. So the answer should be A. So let's review what competitive and non-competitive inhibitors features. So binds to active site, similar shape as substrate, increase, increasing concentration of inhibitor means more enzyme inhibitor complexes are formed. So lesser ES complexes can be formed. Non-competitive inhibitors bind to an allosteric site, which is a site which is other than the active site. It does change the shape of the enzyme and doesn't have a similar shape to the substrate because it binds to an allosteric site. So it doesn't have to 
um, bind to the active site. So this next question, what is the effect of an, en uh, of an enzyme in the enzyme catalyzed reaction? So let's see the options. Decreases the activation energy and decreases the energy yield. Decreases the activation energy and has no effect on the energy yield. Increases the activation energy and increases the energy yield and increases the energy yield and decreases the activation energy. So we know that enzymes provide an alternative pathway with lower activation energy. So A and B are correct options, which we have to talk about. And C and D are, sorry, C is wrong. And we can, can talk about A, B, and D. So what's, why is B correct? So we talked about how enzymes will have no effect on enthalpy change or energy yield. So B should be correct. And decrease in energy yield or increase in energy yield basically means that enzymes are affecting enthalpy change. So A and D is wrong as well. So let's review this question again. So enzymes, they decrease activation energy and energy yield is enthalpy change. So it's not affected by enzymes or catalysts. And so let's look at this diagram here. And this is from chemistry Libre text. So if you want to check that out, you can go ahead. And we have this reaction here. So this is the reactant and product. And as we talked about it, this is the uncatalyzed reaction and this is a catalyzed reaction. And the only difference between this is that a catalyst or enzyme is present and the difference in activation energy, of course. So you notice that how, regardless of the pathway taken, the enthalpy change will remain the same. So yeah, energy, energy yield is not affected by enzymes or catalysts. So this is the last question we'll talk about. So the graph shows the rate of an enzyme catalyzed reaction uh, depends on the concentration of a substrate. So initial rate of reaction over here and substrate concentration. So you can see that um, as you increase the substrate concentration, the initial rate of reaction is increasing. And they're asking what is the KM for this enzyme under these conditions. Okay, so when the when you increase the substrate concentration, there'll be a point where there'll be no further increase, and that point is known as the Vmax, right? So this is the Vmax over here. So it's about at 3.8, 0 0.38, sorry. And so KM is when this when it's at half Vmax. So over here, so half Vmax will be somewhere around here. So about 1.5-ish, and that's option C. And okay, so there's one more question, my bad. So the effect of uh, substrate concentration on an enzyme catalyzed reaction was measured in three different conditions, no inhibitor, competitive inhibitor, and non-competitive inhibitor. So what is this topic testing about? It's testing about how substrate concentration affects inhibition by, um, by these uh, competitive inhibitor or non-competitive inhibitor. So what we have learned is that this X, so okay, well, let's just talk about what we have learned first. So competitive inhibitor, it will be affected by substrate concentration while non-competitive inhibitor will not be affected by substrate concentration at all. So over time, the rate of reaction will, will return to normal as you increase the substrate concentration for competitive inhibitors, but not for non-competitive inhibitors. So let's apply what we have learned to this um, diagram here. So this normal graph, that's enzyme with no inhibitor. And we have this graph which reaches the final um, rate of reaction, this inhibitor X. So this will be competitive inhibitor because, because as you increase the substrate concentration, the, the rate of reaction will basically return to where it's meant to be because the inhibition will be, um, will be removed or will be negated. And non-competitive inhibitor, the substrate concentration um, does not affect the non-competitive inhibitor, so it will remain um, as it is. So let's talk about the initial rate of reaction as well. So the rate of reaction for the normal graph, it's like greater than X because at, at the start and initial, there was a lot of um, inhibition going on, right? So the number of ES complex formed for this solution will be lesser than this. So this will have a lower rate of reaction. So let's talk about these options once. So X is, a comp okay, so we know that X is a competitive inhibitor and Y is a non-competitive inhibitor. So X is a competitive inhibitor which binds to a site other than the active site. This is wrong because competitive inhibitors will always bind to the active site. X is a non-competitive inhibitor. That's wrong. We know it's a competitive inhibitor. Y is a competitive inhibitor. That's wrong. B is a non-competitive inhibitor which binds to a site other than the active site. So 13, yeah, that's correct. Um, sorry, the answer for this question is D because as we discussed, X is a competitive inhibitor binds to active site, Y non-competitive inhibitor binds to allosteric site. 
Okay, so this will conclude the entire chapter of enzymes. I hope these questions, um, theory and uh, questions are being helpful. If you have any questions, leave them in the comment section. Um, do like and subscribe if you find these videos helpful. Share them with your friends so more people can benefit. And if you have any suggestions, do always, do feel free to suggest them in the um, comment section. And yeah, see you in the next video. Hope this video was helpful and happy learning.